Hey, Pastor Josh here. Thanks so much for watching our videos. If you'd like more information about Legacy City Church, you can go to LegacyCityChurch.com. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell below. God bless you. We're going to do just a kind of a topical sermon this morning. We've been working through the book of Matthew. We are 80 sermons deep into the book of Matthew. Um, but we're going to take a sidestep just to uh, reflect um, on a few things that really I was reflecting on as, as I thought about planting the church and just all the work that God has done. Um, the title of the sermon or talk today is called Risking It All, or We Can Risk It All for Christ. Jeremiah chapter 32, we're going to look at, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. And we're just going to look at a couple verses there, but uh, before, we, before we dive in, heard of a story, maybe you heard of this one too. Yeah, there was a priest and an evangelist and a minister in a rowboat in the middle of a pond fishing. None of them had caught anything all morning. Then the evangelist stands up and says he needs to go to the bathroom, so he climbs out of the boat and walks on water to the shore. True story. He comes back 10 minutes later the same way. Then the minister decides he needs to go to the bathroom too, so he climbs out of the boat and he walks on water to the shore. He too comes back the same way 10 minutes later. The priest looks at them both and decides that his faith is just as strong as his fishing buddies and that he can walk on water too. He stands up and he excuses himself. He steps out of the boat. He makes a splash right down into the water. The evangelist looks at the minister and says, I suppose we should have told him where the rocks were. <laughs> it's that simple. We as believers are to live in a manner that proves we are dependent upon God and not ourselves. Upon Jesus and his work, upon the leading and guiding and teaching of the Holy Spirit, which always points us and moves us in the direction of Jesus and his word. Really to know him more and to make him known to the world. If someone looked at our lives now, could they find any proof you are living by faith in any area of your life? Trusting the Lord in some area, not knowing what's going to happen, but believing he will show up and do great things. When we're young, I think we take a lot of risk and really don't care what happens because we have few responsibilities. But as we grow older, we grow comfortable, we grow, grow careful, and we are less likely to take risks, especially for the kingdom. Many times we are neglectful in the area of faith. We are scared to jump out of the boat and even attempt to walk on water. But why? What cripples Christians from taking more risk to bring God glory? I think we don't believe that God will catch us. We are nervous about whether or not it is something God is willing to be a part of and work in. We say, Lord, is that you? Lord, if I take this risk, if I take this step of faith in this area, are you going to show up? And for some reason, when we were children, we believed wholeheartedly. But as we grow old, we're nervous, we're scared, and we find it hard to trust God, and we want to control everything ourselves. How are we to be led by the Spirit of God daily? And know when we should believe God for something great and when we shouldn't. What does it mean to be led by the Holy Spirit? I want to talk about this today. Because I was reflecting on about how crazy it was with that group of people to, to, to dream like that. And to think that God could do something in LA. And to plan a, a church in Studio City. Like, this is kind of foolish, actually. Like, like that's not very strategic if you think about it. That's a really hard city and it's only two square miles, and the real estate is ridiculous, and there's no way you're probably going to survive. You're just going to get attacked and drove out. I see a lot of people, I see a lot of people taking risk for their own lives, but few for the kingdom. It's interesting. People take risks for careers, for business, for investments, for relationships. But what about risks for the kingdom? Huh, we'll put it on the line over here for this, but we won't necessarily put it on the line for Christ. When we planted this church eight years ago, I had no idea it was on the other side of the fence. We just had to jump and believe that God would save and work. And I love that risk. 
But I feel it leaving me as I grow older, and I, I want that to come back. I want to continue living a life of faith for God's glory. I'm so happy I took that step of faith. I'm so happy my friends pushed me to take that step of faith. I'm so happy that so many around were like, yeah, let's just do it. Let's go. Let's see what happens. We walked on water to some degree. God showed up. I want to talk to you about this today. Because I think it is the key to our next few years as a church. We need to be believing and trusting that God will show up in the risks that we take, in the steps that we take in our workplace, in the steps that we take in the city, with our friendships, with our relationships that we take as a church, believing that God will meet us in the midst of these steps of faith. We have to take steps of faith as the Lord is leading and then just trust him as the saints of old did and as all believers are called to do in this day. Hebrews 11.6 says very clearly, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Let me ask you, do you believe this? I want to look at this obscure story in the book of Jeremiah this morning, but really it is Hebrews chapter 11. If you just go back, that's your homework for the week. Just read through Hebrews 11 and watch the crazy steps of faith all these men and women took. God said, do this, go and do this, do this, go and do this, and they just went for it. The Spirit of God showed up in the moment and did great things through them, but they had to take steps of faith, really, to, from Abraham to the prophets of old, to the apostles, to the disciples in the New Testament, they were all called to take steps of faith after salvation. It's like you need faith to be saved. Yes, you do. And you need faith to continue to be saved and to produce sanctification. And I would even challenge to please God, to bless God with your life. Jeremiah chapter 32, very obscure passage, but I'm gonna, I want to show you something that I think is very interesting. Can we stand for the reading of God's word? We always stand for the reading of his word to pay honor to him and to remember whose word we are reading. Not mine. Definitely the Lord's. And from his word, we can extract some beautiful things that apply to all of life. Jeremiah chapter 32, take a look at verse 6 if you're there in your Bibles. It says, Jeremiah said... The word of the Lord came to me. Behold, Hanamil, the son of Shalom, your uncle will come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then Hanamil, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy my field that is at Anoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of passage and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Jeremiah writes, Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray now by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would see really the human side of this prophet trying to understand your will, trying to understand your voice, trying to understand your leading, and that you would help us to see it through all of the saints of old, and how we even are challenged and have difficulty seeing it in this day and age. But I pray, God, that we start to listen to your word more, that we would pray with you more, that we would be ignited to seek you and to take steps of faith for your glory. Bless our time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The context here, if you didn't know, is Jeremiah was imprisoned in the courtyard of the guard in the royal palace. King uh, Zedekiah put him there, asking why he kept giving this prophecy. The king was ticked at Jeremiah because he kept telling this king that the other king, the king of Babylon, was going to take over his kingdom, and if he fights against the king of Bab Babylon, he will not succeed. The king got ticked off at him, and he's like, stop prophesying that. Would you stop saying that, please? If you don't stop, you're going to prison. So he put Jeremiah the prophet in prison for prophesying the truth to him. He says, if you go up against the king of Babylon, you're going to lose. Stop saying that. I'm going to win, he thought. 
But God had spoke to Jeremiah about these things and spoke to them, and, sp and he spoke them to the king as he was told, and it landed him again in prison in the king's courts. That's the context. It says that then Jeremiah received a second word from God while in prison, and the text makes it seem as if he wasn't clear if it was God or not, not until he saw that it came true. Then Jeremiah writes in the text at the end of verse 8, after it came true, and then I knew it was the Lord. The word of the Lord came to him and said that your cousin's going to come to you and offer you to buy the field. When he offers it to you, then you'll know that you need to buy this field. And after the whole scenario happened, he stepped back and said, wow, and then I knew it was the Lord. That was the Lord at work. Now, it seems very simple. It seems very small. But if you watch from Abraham to David to Daniel to Joseph to Job to Paul and the apostles, you watch them have to take very interesting steps of faith after they sense God is leading them to do something or God, by his word, literally told them, I want you to do this. And then even though they heard his word, they had to take a step of faith and actually do it. Jeremiah the prophet has heard the voice of God many times. He's writing the book and writing it down, the words of God. And in this moment, it almost seems as if he didn't know if it was ultimately God moving or not until after it all happened. And I want to draw a parallel line. I'm telling you, I did not know. It's not until moments like these. I did not know it was the Lord until after we took steps of faith to see if God was at work. And then you step back, you take steps of faith to plant the church, and then you step back after eight years, and people look at you like, of course you know. Hey, no, no, go talk to Josh Thompson back in 2014. Um, I, I was probably fired up and a bit um, ignorant and foolish and just flying by the seat of my pants and trying to run with my friends and just trying to figure it out, but I didn't know. I, I could not paint the picture of what was on the other side. We were just jumping. It is the same spirit that came upon David and led him and Joseph through his dreams and his years of prison to make him king of Egypt and Abraham who was told to leave his land by faith and Samson who was led by God with super strength and Moses who was led by God in the wilderness. All the prophets led to speak on God's behalf. All the apostles who were led to the cities and the towns by the spirit of God to preach the truth. They too were praying at some point and asking God for direction. What should we do for our family? What should we do? What is the next step? Do you want me to take that step? Do you want me to do this? Lord, show me what you want me to do. And then they feel something impressed upon them at certain times. And though it looked different throughout history, God literally speaking audibly to people then, not exactly now, but we hear through his word and we sense that God is pressing something on our heart. We still have to take steps of faith now, don't we? The author of Hebrews, again, 11, gives a full breakdown of this, and I dare you to go and read it. The Holy Spirit is a gift given to us when we repent and are baptized and turn to Christ with all of our hearts. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you then will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is a gift from him that comes and lives inside of us when we repent and trust in Jesus alone for salvation. The Holy Spirit coming and living inside of us was spoken about again long ago in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone and your flesh and give you your heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, Ezekiel said speaking for God, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. It was prophesied in Ezekiel that God would put his own spirit into his people. Romans 8 tells us, verse 11, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Spirit will come and guide you in truth. 
John 14, 26, Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He is a helper. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and it will be so that you will be my witnesses into Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's, I'm going to put my spirit in you because it's going to lead you to other cities and other places and towns so that you can be a witness for me of what? My truth. What does a witness do? They testify of what they have seen and heard. They tell the truth. I want to paint a picture of what it means to be led by God's spirit in your life. Because we can become so calculated. And trust me, I love to be calculated. Especially now. I just want things to line up. I, I want things to work. I want it to make sense. And even the risks that we do take, I try to calculate them to see if it will work out, if it's a risk willing to take. But again, for some reason in our spiritual lives, we are very scared to take risks there. What does it look like to walk with God every day in your life? Listening, heeding to the instruction of the Holy Spirit in your specific life. Because guess what? God has an individual plan for each of us, now doesn't he? He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is writing a story for you. And if your life was to be inserted into the Bible and we would read about your life, where would be the steps of faith that you took that God was calling you to take? Do you even know what they are? Do you know what they look like? Do you know what God is calling you to? Have you ever had a moment where you thought the Holy Spirit of God was impressing something upon you, a desire, a feeling, a burden, or something, but you're not sure if it's the Lord? You're, you're, you're not sure if it's the enemy? Uh, you're not sure if it's what you ate for lunch, right? Yes. Thank you. I thought it was funny, too. <laughs> is this you, Lord, or not? I think the sadder thing is that we have to ask ourselves as the church, when is the last time we asked the Lord that? Lord, is that you? Are you calling me to do that? Do you want me to take that step of faith? Do you even have a capacity in your heart or your mind, a space where God can say, I want you to do this, and you say, yes. I'm ready. I'm willing. Lord, send me in there. Lord, call me to do that. Lord, use what I have for your glory. All that I have is yours. I'm ready. Lord, your servant is listening. Jeremiah had this same thing happen to him. And I love this phrase. I remember reading through Jeremiah. And when I saw this phrase, I'm like, wait a minute. Did the prophet doubt? Did he not know? Was he not clear? I thought every prophet, when he just heard God, magically, he knew it was God. But it's very interesting. Because when I reflect on all of the prophets of old and all the apostles and all of the disciples, you remember, they're just men. They're just women like you and me. We see in the New Testament, it says Elijah was a man just like you. And God was using him. And remember, he ran and hid in a cave because he was scared. It's amazing to watch these broken men and women be used by God at a great level. And if you take God away, they're just men and women. But if God shows up, great things happen. And did you know that you could have been one of those to be chosen in the days of old, just like they were. Me? But there's nothing special about me. Exactly. God called who he called because he had a plan. It wasn't because there was anything special about any one of these people. He just said, Moses, you're my guy. Yeah, but I, I, like, I can't even speak. I got a stuttering problem. Nope, you're my guy. No, please, I do not want to be the guy to lead three million people. I'm not your man. Yes, you are. No, please, God, I do not want to speak for you. Like he has this conversation, you can read it in the text. Have my brother Aaron speak for me. Okay, fine. Your brother Aaron will speak for you, but you're holding the staff. You're leading. And then I knew it was the Lord. Point number one, if you're taking notes. 
Again, Jeremiah steps back, and this small exchange happens of buying a piece of property from his cousin. The Lord had spoke to him. He wasn't sure if it was the Lord, and then he writes, and then I knew that this was the word of the Lord after it had happened. In life, there are going to be many times when we are not sure if it's the Lord or not, and even Jeremiah the prophet didn't know, so what are we to do? I say we are to take risks, take the step of faith. Go for it. As long as you're not breaking God's commands and it aligns with his word, go for it. We're going to talk about that a little more in just a moment. Before we do, I want to convince you of why you should take risks for God's kingdom and why you should take chances moving forward in life. Now, this is just an analogy and an illustration. Don't worry, it will work spiritually in just a second. So don't stone me up front, okay? This is a casino story. It's a guy gambling, taking risks. Listen, I heard of a story of a guy who would gamble, walk into a casino with 40 bucks. He would play, win his 40. Then he would give it to his wife to cash in. Now he has 40 in the bank. He has broken even, and no matter what, he's, he's, he's good. So he would play some more, and he won 50 more. And then he would give that to his wife. Now he has 90 in the bank. He made his start money and he made the $50 more. He is just playing with house money now. So he goes back. Now he can play whatever and take risks. And he does. And he goes for it. 40 on black. He wins. And he has 80 and 80 on black. And bam, he wins 160. Now he changes changes it up. 160 on red and it hits black and he loses the 160. But he doesn't care. Because it was just fun for him. He still has 90 in his wife's hand and the 40 he came with and 50 more to go buy some dinner. Now, why did I tell that story? To endorse gambling? Absolutely not. Don't gamble. It's a waste of your money. Please don't do that. But listen to this. Allow me to use the analogy. We could have used other ones, but I thought it made the most quick sense. Here's what I'm getting at. 2 Corinthians 5.12, for our sake... 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Did you know that? Jesus was made sin for our sake. He was treated as if he had committed all of our sin, and we are treated as if we committed all of his righteousness. And we are given all of his righteousness, and he takes all of our sin, and we are seen as perfect or blameless before God, and we get to heaven And Christ was seen as the sinner, and he was punished for our sins. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Again, Jesus took our sinful lives on the cross and gave us his righteous, perfect life. Now watch this. If you add up all of the sin in our lives, that is a huge debt to pay now, isn't it? That's a massive fine, a debt that none of us could pay. Jesus not only paid that debt off so you could go free and not go to hell, but he also filled your account with righteousness so you can go to heaven. Now watch this. Have you ever had overdraft protection on your account in your bank? It's dangerous. If you overdraw your account, the bank will let you go into the negative. But you will have to pay back that debt so you could pay for your ticket. Really, pay off your fine. You have to pay all of that back up in order to get to equal. And then you would have to save up money in order to get back to stability. In that illustration, do you know how many trillions of dollars we are in debt? A lot. Not enough to pay for heaven, that's for sure spiritually. Let's just say you could pay for a ticket to heaven, but it would cost you a hundred trillion. But every time you sin and breaks God's holy law in your account, your account is charged a thousand dollars fine. An overdraft is kicking in. Some of your bank accounts are already millions now, aren't they? Of debt. But Jesus paid your debt. 
and brought it back up to zero. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. But not only has Jesus paid the debt and brought you to zero in your account, and you're not going to hell when you die, he has also placed more than enough money in your account to pay for a ticket to heaven in his righteousness. His righteousness is literally filling up your account to the brim, a hundred trillion dollars into your account so that you can pay for a ticket to heaven. Money to pay for all of your needs. Money to pay for rest and peace. Money to pay for all the blessings and promises that are found in Christ. The account is filled to the brim so that you could spend for eternity and it will never go dry. Because of the work that Christ did on the cross, all that is found in him. He not only took care of all of your overdraft, all of your debt. He died on the cross for that and filled it, but then he gave you his perfect life of righteousness to fill it up so that you could get to heaven when you die. Watch this. The money is in the bank. You can't lose. Compared to the casino, the money is in the bank. You're playing with house money now. Jesus took all the risk. Jesus already filled up the account. He's won so much. It doesn't even matter anymore. What are you going to lose when you take steps of faith for his glory? That's the reason you don't take steps of faith, because you're scared you're going to lose something. We're scared it's not going to work. We're scared we're going to fail. We're too nervous about paying for that family's rent because it's too much out of our account. We're too scared to take steps of faith because it's going to take up too much time. We're too scared to take steps of faith because they're not going to appreciate what I do. Uh, I'm too scared to take steps of faith because I don't know if God's going to show up and that'll burn up three years of my life if I try to do a church plant. What if it fails? Listen, the money's in the bank. You're going to heaven when you die. You can't lose any of it and you can't lose the blessings and promises of God. So you're just playing with house money. You literally can go for it. You can risk. And I want to tell you this. This is the reason Abraham left his land not knowing where he was going. He knew that God had promised him that he would be with him. His account was full. And he said, you want me to leave my family and my land and just pursue you with everything? Okay. I believe you by faith. And we know that God showed up over and over and over and over and over again. Because the account was full. It's the same with the apostles. It's the same with the prophets. Taking a step of faith in your life does not decrease your account. Did you know that? But many of you are playing this game of life like your account is still in overdraft protection. You're playing as if uh, you, you, you don't have anything in your account. You're playing, you're playing as if Christ did not pay at all and take care of everything and that we have to do something. Point number two, if you're taking notes, be spirit-led within the confines of Scripture. If it is possible that you could not know it's the Lord or wonder if it's the Lord at work, I just want to, let, let's, just, let's just throw this out there. Maybe this week or this month or this year you're in prayer and you're seeking the Lord and a situation comes up or an opportunity comes up or something happens and you're sensing, Lord, is this you? You're trying to figure out, Lord, is this you? You need to know you won't know until the other side probably. But if it aligns with Scripture, within the confines of Scripture, I dare you to take a risk, take a step of faith and see if God might show up in it. Do what you sense the Lord leading you to do within the confines of Scripture. Again, the Holy, the Holy Spirit will help you. He will teach you all things. He will bring to remembrance truth. He will guide you in all truth. Listen, the Holy Spirit is not going to lead you to take risks or steps of faith that contradict Scripture. If you hear something telling you to murder somebody, that is not the Holy Spirit, okay? You don't have to pray about that. Did you know that? Lord, should I? Lord, should I? No. Okay, oh, thou shalt not murder. It's very clear. You don't have to pray about that. You don't have to pray about dating a non-believer. Did you know that? You don't have to pray about getting drunk tonight. Did you know that? That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will only speak his word. 
which is in the scripture and will always point to Jesus. If it's against God's word, it doesn't matter what you feel. You don't have to pray about it, and you should not step and take steps of faith to break God's commands and law. This is dangerous. It's not God speaking to you. But it was a light telling me that's dangerous too. But if it aligns with God's word, and you have a burden that you are sensing from the Holy Spirit, do it. All of a sudden, you're standing there at church, and I don't know, you know, you find out through the grapevine, through a couple people, that so and so struggling with something, and they're not going to be able to make their car payment, and they're going to lose their car. But it's, you know, it's, it's quite expensive, maybe for your budget, but you sense a burden for some reason, and you're like, God, is that you? And you go home, and you're like, Lord, are you calling me? and my wife to do this? Are we to help this family? What do you want us to do, Lord? Well, your word says that we should really love one another, serve one another, help one another. We should be generous. Everything in your word kind of tells me that maybe I should take a step of faith and do this. But man, I don't know if this is going to do our budget. Should we do this? And the calculated side of you says, well, they're not even going to, you know, they're just, they're just going to burn up more money anyways. They're going to mess it up in the future. So why should we help them? But then... You sense the burden, it aligns with scripture, and you take a step of faith, and you go and bless them. And then all of a sudden, they want to have a conversation about finance for some reason. You get to help them out with a couple things, and it sends them on a trajectory where those things don't happen again. And then you look back and say, and then I knew it was the Lord. I was supposed to take that step of faith and help them. If it does align with God's word and you have a burden to do it, you're sensing it from the Holy Spirit, you should just go for it. I dare you. Why are we playing it so safe? Especially in a city like LA. This place ain't safe. We gotta get after it. We need to take risks. If we want God to move, he's just waiting on his people to stand up and go. Point number three, and finally, if you're taking notes, go until he says no. Go until he says no. If you're not breaking God's law and you feel it's the Lord, go for it. Take the risk. The money is in the bank. You have nothing to lose. You won't know it's the word of the Lord until after. Then I knew it was the Lord. You're not going to know, so you just need to go until he says no. The worst that can happen is the Lord says no and closes the door, and that's fine. At least you took the step of faith. Psalm 84, 11, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. What do, I can't even imagine. What if I just, we'd never stepped in L.A.? We'd never taken the risk. We'd never gone for it because we were nervous. We were scared. We were scared God was going to show up. We look at the city so big. It's like, no, but this ain't going to work. How are we going to do this? You just go until the door closes, and then you go some more, and the door will close, and you go some more, and the door will close, and you go some more, and the door will close. And before you know it, you're guided exactly into the place where you're supposed to go. We tried to plant the church. We tried to go to Venice. We tried to go to downtown LA, the Arts District. We tried to go to Silver Lake. We're in Santa Monica. We're driving all over the place. And it's just like, no, 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 no. Eight months of driving to try to find a building. It was just no, 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 no. And boom, all of a sudden we came here. And this was the only yes we received in eight months of asking. This is it. Wow, you guys were so strategic. Laurel Canyon, Ventura Boulevard. How'd you get into that private school? Wow, the neighborhood is perfect. It's backed up into the community. This was so strategic. Not really. (laughs) We were just going and going and going. I didn't even know what Laurel Canyon was, to be honest. I didn't. All the rock hits hitting around. I mean, it's just amazing what sits right here. The Lord withholds, if the Lord withholds something from you, watch this, it must not be good for you. Because the Lord will not withhold anything good from those who walk uprightly. So if he's saying no to it, guess it's not good. Guess Venice wasn't good. I guess downtown LA wasn't good. Guess Silver Lake wasn't good. I guess Studio City was the good place. That's where he wanted us to be. But it takes faith. Proverbs 16, 9, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. You can plan all you want, but God will change your plans, huh? And he'll change them again and again and again 
And you either start yielding to his plans. You, 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 can, you can grit your teeth in your hands all the way through it and, and, and be forced to grow. Or you can yield to him and just start walking in him in humility. Walk humbly with your God. Just walk with him through life. And let him lead and guide your every step and help that person over here and step out in that ministry and take a risk over here and do this thing and share the gospel in that place and open up your home for this. You keep taking steps of faith and boom, things start happening and you look back and you say, and then I knew it was the Lord. God has a plan and is working everything out for his glory and our good. Let me tell you a story. You hear about the guy who had good things and bad things happen to him. One day this guy came home from work and he sees his front door, his front yard completely flooded. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing, right? Well, his neighbor sees what happens and he comes to help and they end up talking and a friendship goes. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. And as he becomes close friends with this neighbor, he finds out he's an alcoholic and he cheats on his wife, not the best person to hang out with. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Kind of seems like a bad thing. But the man is actually a Christian and sees the opportunity to share his faith with his neighbor and minister the gospel to this hurting marriage. And he does so, and he takes a step of faith and a risk, and he becomes a Christian. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. But because he becomes a Christian, his boss at work doesn't like it, and he fires him for being a Christian and wanting Sundays off. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. But the neighbor, because of the loss of job, begs and prays God for another job, and the Lord provides a better job that pays more money and has better benefits. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. But because the man is making more money, he becomes greedy and starts to fill his heart with greed. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. The neighbor across the street starts to see and notice the greed of his friend and, and his heart, and he rebukes and corrects him and encourages him and prays for him, and he repents and turns back to the Lord and starts living a more generous life for the Lord than ever before, those in his life and those in his church. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. How do you know? How do you know? The bad thing's happening in your life. How do you know? It's not a good thing right around the corner. How do you know? Interesting. And then I knew it was the Lord. And then I knew there are those aha moments where you're like, Lord, incredible. How did I not see it? It was you all along. If you ask Joseph in prison, if you ask Job in his pain, if you ask Jesus on the cross, is this bad? Many would say, yes, so bad. But looking back on what God was doing in those dark moments, we see they were for ultimate good. The Lord has his ways and knows what he is doing. You may think you're in a bad situation. You should probably think again and trust the Lord. It could be a good thing that God has in store for you right around the corner. You never know what the Lord is doing. And then I knew it was the Lord. I am telling you, the money is in the bank. Take the risk. You can't lose heaven. You can't lose your blessings and promises. All you can do is lose the opportunity to bless God and bring him glory. Number two, be led by the Holy Spirit within the confines of Scripture. Don't do anything outside of God's Word. And then number three, just go until he says no. Take risks. Go for it. And then you'll find out if it's the Lord or not. I dare you to pray for someone in public. I dare you to pay for somebody's bills. I dare you to take a step of faith and love people, take time for people, stop and help that person instead of walking past them. If you sense the Lord leading you, go for it. You never know if it's the Lord unless you take the step of faith. And we would have never known it was the Lord unless we took the step of faith to plant this church, huh? Praise God he showed up. Uh, if you knew me, which many of you do, you know it may not happen, okay? <laughs> Praise God he showed up. And I believe that the Lord is challenging us once again to start taking great steps of faith. And let's just see what he'll do, amen? I want to read it one more time to you. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This is every great believer in the Bible. They just believed God at his word and they took radical steps of faith to see what he might do. And then they look back on life and said, wow, then I knew it was the Lord. Look what God has done. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray now by the power of your Holy Spirit, oh God, would you challenge and ignite each of us to stop being so relaxed in our faith and just enjoying the life. But Lord, would we seek you earnestly, spend time praying and saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to accomplish in this day, in this week, in this month, in this year, in this lifetime before it's over? Lord, is there anything else you want me to do? I'm here. We yield ourselves to you. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. The whole thing belongs to you. You are the one who put the burden and the desire on our hearts to step out in faith. You are the one who provided the faith. You were the one who provided the desires. You were the one who provided everything. And made it happen. And then you, Lord, drew the people to yourself. Lord, you, by your word and by your spirit, changed lives. Lord, you have done the work and accomplished the work. And so once again, we yield to you. And we ask, Lord, what do you want us to do? What are you up to? Reveal to us your will for our lives. Impress things upon our hearts. Help us to dream for your glory. Help us have vision to do great things like you did with the saints of old, with our church fathers. Give us wisdom. We give all that we have into your hands these next years, these next 10 years, these next 20 years, these next 30 years. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.